Laguna Beach is one of the world's most naturally beautiful beach towns. Nestled in the hills of Southern California and surrounded by azure seas, Laguna attracts thousands of visitors each year. <laughs> the locals, as they are affectionately known, include world-famous surfers as well as a colony of artists whose works grace the homes, museums, and offices of major collectors around the world. I've collected over many years now and mostly from local artists. I love their energy. I like um, how they work with inspiration here in our local community. I think it's very important that, that everybody supports the arts in Laguna Beach because that's what we're all about. In 1931, a small group of artists began a unique entertainment with the first Living Pictures event that became the forerunner of today's famous Pageant of the Masters. During the summer months, Laguna Beach hosts three well-known festivals that showcase work by local as well as internationally known artists. Laguna Beach is very fortunate to have all three festivals. Each one is unique and rare in its own way. If someone comes to Laguna Beach and visits all three shows, they will go home with a full art experience. The Art Affair hosts a juried show with 125 artists and master craftsmen from around the world. It invites its guests to see the world through an artist's eyes. The Festival of Arts, the oldest festival venue and home to the Pageant of the Masters, is a juried show enhanced with demonstrations, music, and dance performances. There's over 160 artists here, all different types of medium, jewelry, sculpture, furniture, paintings, and it's really a joy to see it all. And the diversity of the people that come to see the art is really just a wonderful experience. The Sawdust Art Festival holds a special place in the hearts of local artists. It is unjuried, but requires that artists be residents of Laguna Beach. It's open to someone that is trying to begin their artistic career and grow it. And having the opportunity to be around other more experienced artists to gain advice, uh, direction, critique, and encouragement. Part of its unique charm is the setting amidst a beautiful grove of eucalyptus trees. Individual booths are recreated each year at locations allocated by a lottery system. This gives the sawdust a fresh look each year. Sawdust is wonderful. It, 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 they had enough sense to make it not just an art show but an event. <laughs> We call it the, the party of the year because so many people want to come. Local people fight over the invitations. It means the real start of summer. It's a communion. It's a small community communion. Being able to kind of walk around freely and, and, and see everything and you have entertainment, you have food, uh, it's, just, it's just a vibrant feeling here. These shows are part of people's summer experiences. They're part of their youth. They love it. They're returning now with their children, their grandchildren. And we're part of histories that families treasure. Laguna Beach is home to many innovative artists, but one that caught our attention is James Cook, sculptor of the found object. When I first started at the Sawdust, and I was developing this art form, people would walk in my booth and they'd go, you call this art? This is just junk. And I have to admit, in the beginning, I wasn't as sophisticated as I am now. Long before the concept of green was trendy and politically correct, James Cook was creating work from scraps of rusted metal and old discarded chunks of man-made objects. I take something that's going to be thrown away and make it beautiful. Let's say a saw blade is made to cut down trees, but I'll take that after its lifetime as a saw is used up and make it wings for a bird. James spends a portion of each year caring for his 94-year-old father Virgil in his hometown of Newell, Wisconsin. We're going to Goodovich's General Store and their motto is if we don't have it, you don't need it. 
it's a very small community, small town, about 82 people. There's absolutely nothing to do, so it's either weld or wither. Something happened when I went back to Wisconsin. Uh, it, I changed. Uh, my art got much better. I'm in my hometown. I'm in the house I was born and raised again, so maybe I get back into my very childlike quality of being a kid again, you know, and just making stuff. One day, I went out to the town dump and I found this old bed spring, box spring. I somehow managed to get that box spring home with my little red wagon. I'm like seven or eight years old. And I have it in the front yard and I'm using it as a trampoline. I'm jumping up and down on it. And then my father comes home and he goes, gosh darn it, Jimmy. I haul a load to the dump and it beats me home. I'm close to the source, you know, 45 minutes away from this um, scrapyard that I call the gold mine. I met James about 10 years ago in the scrapyard and he come and was looking for different items, found object art, and he wanted to know if I could find any and save him any pieces. They pre-sort as saw blades come in, they put them in a pile or chains or ball bearings and hoops, metal hoops. My friend Tom, I told him I wanted every hoop he could lay his hands on, so about two weeks later he delivered 2,500 hoops. So I have like a lifetime supply. A lot of my creative process happened right at the scrapyard. I'm seeing sculpture that you can push around the yard. I would find things at the scrapyard and I traveled with a little uh, disposable camera. And I would lay them on the ground and take a picture. I knew what the piece was going to look like in my mind. But then after I got it out to California in a crate and I would look at it and I'd go, I have no idea where I was going with this. I'm so excited about finding more of this stuff. And one time I was moving pitchforks and I looked at them and I went, oh my God, they're rooster tails. Then all of a sudden I'm heating uh, the pitchforks up red hot and bending them and twisting them. And a wrench, a pitchfork, a rake for wings, a ball bearing for a head. And sometimes I go up to that scrapyard and I'll look and look and look, and I can't find one single thing that will intrigue me or interest me. And other times I go up there and I come home with a pickup load. I, you know, it's, the truck rides uphill all the way home. Today was an exceptionally good day as far as gathering stuff. I wave my truck when I go into the scrapyard, and then after I've gone and searched and found my pieces of metal, I weigh when I go out. And every once in a while they'll go, wow, not a very good day, huh? Okay, I have no idea what this is the byproduct of, but, but once a year I find just a few pieces of this. And through the grace of God, I managed to weld it into a successful sculpture. Part of being a found object artist is, uh, is having the eye to spot the art in a pile of scrap, which is what I call myself, a found object artist. His ability to look at something that is everyday and, and perhaps somewhat forgettable, and he saw the beauty in that. I don't know what these were, but I see heron bodies. And make it something that would catch you off guard and make you laugh or something that might draw you in and, and give you pause for contemplation. I think what captures you about James' work is that these are all found objects. And I probably trip across found objects every day of my life, but I don't see the artistic integral parts of them, and James does. And I find a really interesting piece of metal. I can be back in my backyard within 45 minutes working with it. This one's gonna be about, I'd say, seven or eight feet tall when I'm done. We got like two acres of mowed lawn so I can lay projects out and kind of scope four or five things at the same time until one talks to me. And this is how I, I'll start to work. I'll just start laying pieces of iron out that are going to be incorporated in the sculpture, checking out the composition, building up layers. When I'm sculpting, I like a nice balance of um, geometric versus the organic. So maybe that's why I'm so in love with uh, gears because there's machine made and they're they're faceted and they're precise. And then it plays against the real organic of the bent metal and the burnt metal. This stuff was made in the 30s. This stuff was made in the 40s. And all that material is no longer going to be available. I think it's part of a hydraulic system on a caterpillar cat. But it's got the nice resonance. Tone. 
So that's going to make a very nice bell. Hand hammered iron has a life of its own because it's mm. it's the maker's life. It's like an original oil painting. Exactly. They have life of their the own, even though yeah. they're ugly. Yeah. Oh, they're not ugly. Well, I know, but some of them are. But because they're handmade... <laughs> I have yet to see an ugly <laughs> piece of iron. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. I get goosebumps sometimes when I find the, a intriguing shape or piece of iron. He's impassioned about rocks and rust. Just the combination, the dichotomy of the stone with the texture of the rusted metal and the shapes he uses, he's very creative. It's so good natured and it's, uh, it's so reflective of, of, of his sensitivities and his sense of humor. I don't know where the ideas come from. I started last summer to make these little wire sculptures of horses and I started calling them Picorsos. These are one solid piece of wire. They start out on the left front foot and go up and down and around and around, and then they end up on the right hind foot, and it's one solid piece of wire. At, at any rate, Pablo Picasso um, did the same thing on, with pen and paper, and I had no idea. My, my bucket of crunch chrome bumpers, which I will make a guardian angel out of. His Catholic upbringing can be seen in the recurring shapes and symbols in his work. Obviously sunk way deep into my, um, my subconscious because it keeps bubbling out. Even when I, I think I'm trying to not do it, I do it. Like the California condor, if you look at that, it's very much, the arrangement is very much a cross. One of my favorite images I've come up with is a heart and it's got like a a twist of barbed wire on it and I'm thinking like that whirlwind feel when you're first falling in love that giddiness you have and then of course because it's barbed wire wrapped around a heart people equate it to the crown of thorns so these are all bells about a month before the festival opens James ships the sculptures out to his home in Laguna Beach that long journey requires thoughtful planning packing and the creation of a giant crate to ensure the safe arrival of his latest creations. Yes, this is going to be equivalent to Howard Carter opening up King Tut's tomb. 2,900 pounds of art. Let's survive this A little guardian angel. Is that going to be <laughs> fabulous? My six foot feather. We have them in six feet, five feet, and four feet. I ended up making this some. Um, Almost life-size horse. That's probably the best thing I've done this year. Now well, the feathers might be the best thing I've done. <laughs> so I need it right in the middle here. Okay. Next, the setup time at the sawdust. An annual adventure and not without its surprises. Yesterday was the initial inspection by the city and the city planner um, decided that I had way too much weight on my roof and my, build, my booth wasn't built to code even though I built it very, very sturdy. I got a phone call from the manager of the sawdust that I had to take all my art off my roof and I just didn't want to do that. My very dear friend Steve stuck with me last night and we worked till like 12, 30, 1 o'clock. Reinforcing with 4x4s and earthquake straps, but we did it. We made it right. This could be adjusted if you come on. Collectors look forward to the Sawdust Art Festival and a chance to add to their collections. Oh, I would look forward to seeing his work every summer at the Sawdust Festival. He was one of the few artists that I made a point to look for first and then see what else was uh, available. I always go to opening night and I always buy the best piece he has. <laughs> or I try to anyway. In addition to showing his work at the Sawdust Festival, his pieces are in galleries throughout the country, including the Flying Pig Gallery and Green Space in Algoma, Wisconsin. James also creates site-specific works. One day he came to my home to look at the space and started talking about the possibility of him creating an art piece, a large arch. I love the wagon wheels. The chain, the pitchfork that he used, he created uh, the phoenix rising, and uh, it just fascinates me, all the, the parts that he put together to make up the whole. I forgot how much I like this piece. <laughs> One of James' loves is to create public art. 
I call it Wings of Victory because it has this flying motion. And I always have a rock. This is an ocean-rolled rock gleaned from the beaches in Southern California. This piece um, I call um, Recycled Warrior. Um, I was commissioned for five pieces of public art. It was my very first uh, public art commission, and which uh, eventually I want to end up doing a lot more public art. Uh, this particular piece I call Lightning Bowl. It's one of my favorite pieces, but then I love lightning bolts. I love thunder and lightning storms. It's something from my childhood. My long-term plans is to do uh, monumental um, business art, corporation art, art for in front of banks and shopping malls, um, and on a monumental scale. I don't know whatever possessed me to make a big feather. Other than now I want a feather that's 40 feet tall made out of stainless steel standing on its quill so that it uh, pivots in the wind. A lot of the art that I'm producing these days I look at as marquettes, like just a model. Take for instance the, uh, the falcon here. I could see that about 40 feet tall in front of a bank. Titles are integral to his work and add another dimension of whimsy to his pieces. I'll take a couple pieces of odd metal and weld it together and come up with a snappy title and people will look at the piece of work then look at the title and go of course it is so I know I've connected. Mm -hmm. I have moon unit gathering samples. The witch doctor is in. Eye of the storm. Shooting star. Somebody saw it and said you know what this star is and I said no and he said it's a target from the carnival when they used to shoot 22s and if you knock the star over you won a prize so it was like a double innuendo or so. Um, I just love titles. Sometimes I think I sculpt so I can title. Let's make this spring shorter, okay? James is a natural-born teacher who has the desire and the ability to inspire others. James became my student teacher. He was full of ideas. He could do anything. I love to teach. I love drawing things out of people that they don't even know is there. My motto when I'm teaching class is there are no mistakes. A mistake is a breakthrough. Every artist is continually confronted with the challenge of creating work that is fresh, exciting, and new. James is no exception. He went from making little viable pieces to these big, wonderful pieces that, that really reflect who he is. Exquisite refinement, and, and it's materials-based refinement, because he's so in love with the materials that they speak to him differently. His Adam and Eve pieces his Adam and Steve pieces, <laughs> you know, they're, they're wonderful and uh, they, they reflect his, his sense of whimsy. He's definitely gotten a lot more sophisticated in his work and, uh, and I think more creative. The size and scale and, and shape of them has changed dramatically and, and now these are big important pieces of work. It's still organic, it still grabs you by the heart and sort of jerks you around. But James is much more organized now than he used to be. <laughs> I want to control the found object instead of having it control me so I can shape it and change it. A lot of like what I do with the fire and the wings, you know, uh, to cut it apart, reassemble it. Um, and one more final step is to have it cast in bronze. While most viewers enjoy the work and the skillful assembling of materials, it's clearly not for everybody. Mr. Cook, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what you think about Jim's art. <laughs> uh, to me, it's junk. <laughs> what may be one man's junk is another man's treasure. I make a firefly out of a spark plug. And I've had 80-year-old women buy them because it reminded them of their, their husband. I've had younger women buy them because it reminded them of their grandfather who never threw a spark plug away. I've had five-year-old kids save their allowance so that they could buy a spark plug firefly. Men love my booth because they come in and they pick my art apart. They'll like go, oh, there's a crescent wrench. Oh, there's a, a pickaxe. Oh, there's a, um, they, they just pick it apart. Women see my work more objectively. They see it for the shapes and the forms. They don't, they don't realize what they're looking at. It's very clever. Uh, very, very clever. I like pop, punk, cutting edge art, in your face art, art is not supposed to match the sofa in my book. It's supposed to be a statement and stand on its own. And um, sometimes my work is like harsh and, but humorous. You know, it's kind of a dichotomy. People look at it and they go, God, this is wonderful, but barbed wire and a heart? James isn't designing sculptures to match your lazy boy lounger. 
although he might like to use the metal structures found within it. There's a hide-a-bed frame in here and four recliner rocker frames. And we burn them and then we get this metal and then I take it from there. Uh, and I got people saving them for me. I got uh, one hide-a-bed and eight recliner rockers waiting for me when I go back home to weld. He's very special to us all and uh, everybody's got a James story. He's an unforgettable person. He has uh, this innocence and this warmth, he's got a, an openness. He's absolutely hysterical. Uh, and I think people either will uh, adore him or hide from him. If, uh, you know, I don't think there's anybody, anybody neutral on James. He's been able to endear himself uh, to everyone here. He's a sweetheart. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, he's a man with a heart. Well, God bless. He's a man with a heart and he's a man with a, a, a beautiful mind. I'm saving shovels, gravel shovels. This is a gravel shovel. This is a, I don't know what kind of shovel you call it. But I, I want to make a, a huge dragon and I want these to be the scales. Um, that's a big project and obviously that'll be like something that I make and keep in northern Wisconsin, I think back in the popple thicket back there. James came to Laguna with inherent talent and a dream. His willingness to release his childlike and playful approach to art should encourage us to consider that we too might return to the source of our own artistic impulses. He encourages each of us to explore, define, and express our own artistic vision. Children seem to come to this more naturally. As adults, perhaps we need to entertain the notion that we, like James, can return to a source that allows us to be more childlike and playful in our approach to life. Laguna Beach is one of those magical places that inspires the artist that resides in each of us. There's something magical that goes on here. We've all tried to figure it out, and I don't know if we're ever really going to find the answer. Don't have coffee with James. He's like Gerald McBoing Boing when he has coffee. What's changed over the years about the Sawdust Festival? Our behavior is better. <laughs> Used to get very raucous out here. Yeah. James, you owe me dinner. <laughs> <laughs>